Welcome back to the Tuesday edition. I know we're getting it out a little late today, but uh, we are back. Silver and Black today in Austin Sports Original Podcast covering the Las Vegas Raiders. Scott Branson, along with Mo Moten, who's back. He was off last week, but he's here back to talk to all of you. So we welcome him back in. Do us a favor, wherever you get your audio, subscribe to the podcast, rate, subscribe, and uh, give it a thumbs up too as well if you're watching us on YouTube, where you can also subscribe and hit that notifications bell so you know every time we have a new video. But we're back. Uh, mandatory minicamp started today in Henderson for the Raiders. Of course, the Raiders wrapped up OTAs last week. They'll do this minicamp this week, Tuesday through Thursday, and then it kind of will shut down until – we get to the end of July, the kind of dead period in the NFL, if you will. But Raiders Media Day was yesterday. We're going to talk a little bit about that, where we heard Antonio Pierce talk about uh, um, the the team overall, kind of the different mood, the different attitude. And then also Christian Wilkins, who we'll talk about as well on the Raiders defense. We'll also learn a little bit about Max Crosby and aliens. Yes, we will. I know. It's off-season, folks, so we're we're going to do some fun stuff here. Uh, I bring in my partner, of course, Mo Moten. Mo is the senior NFL writer at Bleacher Report, also the Raiders columnist at sportsnot.com. You can follow him on x.com at Mo Moten, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. I am at LV Gully. The show is SNB today. Mo, welcome back. Uh, some some folks missed you last week. Other folks uh, seemed to relish in the fact you were gone. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but we had some fun. There was a couple calls that I got to. I'm gonna have Thursday. I'm gonna replay one of them for you because it was somebody who wanted you to walk through at least briefly a little bit of your career track and how it all happened and stuff like that. So we'll get to that on Thursday. But uh, Raiders going in to mini camp starting today. Uh, what do you want to see? I mean, OTAs, we didn't see a lot, but minicamp is in essence the same sort of thing you see in camp in July just uh, for a few days. And so they ramp it up a little bit. And I'm wondering for you coming out of a mini camp, is there anything that we can learn that we don't already know? That much you can learn, really. I mean, mini camp is to me, the difference between mini camp and OTAs is that mini camp, you know, it's not voluntary. Mandatory <laughs> is the operative word here. So you're, you know, you're expected to show up. Of course, players who want a new contract will skip mandatory minicamp because if you're on a rookie deal, the team could still waive those fines. The Raiders don't have that issue. So for the most part, everyone should be there at minicamp. But I, I don't expect to learn very much other than maybe is there a separation between Aiden O'Connell and Garner Minshew in the quarterback mm -hmm. competition? Because up to this point, there really hasn't been much separation. There hasn't been much to talk about the quarterback competition other than, yeah, Aiden O'Connell had a good day here. He took care of the football. Garner Minshew looks solid here. But really there's no, in my opinion, there's no front runner for the job. Yeah. And and it, I'm interested too because you talk about the, the, this being mandatory and there really isn't a ton of guys that, that you don't expect to be there, uh, per your point. But at the same time, uh, our good friend Vinny Bonsignor wrote a, a piece today about the Raiders. And one of the question marks he had, along with what yours was around the quarterbacks, was around whether Devontae Adams will be there. Uh, and so that's the first time I've kind of heard about that. And, and obviously veterans, um, they might be able to get an exemption sometimes. Even though it's mandatory, you can come and maybe you're not going to be on the field. So who knows? He's been there throughout the whole offseason program, so you would expect him to be there, um, but he's done most of that behind the scenes. He hasn't been out on the field catching passes, and so we'll see if that happens coming out of the minicamp. And then the quarterback situation is right, and I think this is also, too, where you start to get a little more noise around uh, young players. So the rookies coming in and what do they do and what impact do they do? Because you start to show work ethic as a rookie, right, in these camps, these, these mini – mini camps and of course during OTAs uh, not enough maybe to tell us Mo who's going to start or who's going to compete for a lot more playing time but you start to get a sense for who's really plugged in who seems to be catching up and who seems to be fitting in right so just one quick note on the Devontae Adams front just remember players don't always skip mandatory mini camp there's this thing called holding in where they show up to mini camp but they don't practice actively which is called holding in it's a loophole to get around the fines in the collective bargaining agreement. So if you again, if you don't show up, you, you're subject to fines. But if you show up and just don't practice, you're still protesting your contract, but you're not subject to those fines. So just one note for Devontae Adams. He doesn't have any guaranteed money 
and the last two years of his deal. So if right. he if he is not practicing and there's a contract issue there, that would be it. I wrote a piece on Sportsnet that's gonna that's gonna be out on Thursday that says one of the things that the Raiders should consider is a new contract about the abs. But to your to your point about mandatory mini camp and what's going on with the rookies and Vinny Bots and US Peace, it is important for the rookies to establish a, a strong work ethic. I don't think that'll be a problem for the Raiders. Uh, a lot of the guys that from the short clips that I've seen, from the short tidbits that I've seen from their rookie class, those guys are ready to go and understand that they have to compete for their jobs. Though we both expect Brock By- Brock Bowers and Jackson Powers Johnson to have a big role this year. Both of those guys seem motivated to get on the field. And some of the positives in their resume, their collegiate resume, was they're hardworking players, and they're going to come in, and they're going to earn their spot. Absolutely. No, that's going to be good. And and, and this will be the last couple days of football that we'll see for a bit. Uh, But we also saw yesterday – uh, Raiders media day. So this is where they take all their pictures. They do all that kind of all the video stuff they do for the, the television networks, all that jazz they did yesterday. And of course uh, they had live coverage of that as well. Our good friend Q Myers and, and JT, the brick and Eric Allen were live and talking to players as they came through the the cycle, which was great to hear some, from some of those guys. Because in today's NFL, you don't get as much access to players as you used to. So it was nice to hear that. But the one conversation I wanted to bring, and there was a lot. They talked to Max Crosby. They talked to Trey M. Morg. They talked to a bunch of different uh, cats from the team. But uh, this one was interesting because I, I I just the, – the, the impact that Christian Wilkins is going to have on the defensive front – Mo, I think is going to be big. And I, I I know that everybody looks at this Raiders defense and thinks they're going to be very good. And and we still have some question marks there, like the outside at cornerback, which Antonio Pierce said yesterday that he feels the guys that are there will compete and they'll find their solution there. I still think they'll sign somebody. But nonetheless, he talked about Christian Wilkins and his impact and what he means to the team. So I have this video clip here that we have from the Raiders. I'm going to play for you guys, too. So if you're on audio, you will hear it. If you're watching us on video, you will see it. Here's, here is Antonio Pierce talking about the impact of Christian Wilkins and what he means to the team. Really different. Yeah. And you don't know that until you watch practice. And you with Christian each and every day. The other day, we went over here to the Aces, played a little basketball, a little team bonding. You know who the best player was? Christian Wilkins. <laughs> not even close. We're all sitting there like, what the world is this? Right, right. We're in the pound man dunk. Yeah. Yeah. But more importantly, the love, the leadership, the passion, the desire to win. We got to bring in winners. We got to bring in guys that want to win, that's going to strain. There's two gentlemen in this building every day before coaches. Max Crosby, Christian Wilkins. They have to be on the same line, line playing the next one. God bless everybody, everybody else. else. Don't worry about my quarterback. Don't worry about my quarterback. Don't worry about my How much better does it make everyone on that defense having that, that big fellow in the middle of them? Man, just having Christian, again, along with Max, and, and how they work, work the effort, the pursuit, the consistent perfection of chasing to be the best at their position. You, you're, you're, you're foolish, foolish if, you're not, if, you're if you're not on the train, train and you're running with these guys. guys. Right, right. You guys got to hear the couple days, days, go through mini camp. camp. Just watch them run. run. Just watch our guys. Watch, watch, the guys. watch the effort. Watch the passion. Watch the, watch the, the bond, the excitement the excitement they play with. Play with. Yeah. Yeah. That's been That's every day. Because we walk back and back. Energy from station to station to station. And I get it. I get it. The rah rah energy, all that stuff. No, no, no. It ain't AP no more. You got to deal with them dudes. AP don't play. I got the headset on right now. I'm walking. You got to deal with them suckers. It's more important. Everybody on our team now has taken ownership. To be the best, be the best they can. That's why we That's had, why we had 30, 35, 35 guys, here. guys here. The entire, the entire office office. when we got here. Well, there you go. There's uh, Antonio Pierce talking a little bit about Christian Wilkins. Uh, nothing surprising there, Mo. But it, you know, the one thing I will say, always say about Antonio Pierce is uh, genuine guy. Really believes it. And and talk about that though. That impact where he talks about how athletic. I know Raider fans and Raider Nation. They know that Christian Wilkins. Uh, is is a great player and what he was able to do in Miami. But with him there, the Raiders have a player up front they haven't had for a while. They've been looking for that three technique, uh, push up the middle defensive tackle, and they finally got it to compliment Max Crosby on the outside. So it, going beyond Christian Wilkins really quick, the Raiders defensive front, I wrote this, should be one of the best in the league. Mm-hmm. When you consider Malcolm Kuntz and what he did, he how he came on last year. When you consider Tyree Wilson now going through a full healthy offseason, when you consider bringing back John Jenkins and Adam Butler, in totality, it should be it should be a defensive line that that gives a lot of offensive lines and quarterbacks 
problems in the upcoming season. Now, with Christian Wilkins, he had a career high in sacks last year. I believe he had nine. So he broke out as a pass rusher, and that's what the Raiders needed in the middle. And you're going to see some possibly some double teams on Christian Wilkins, which will open things up for the other guys on that front line, along with double teams from Max Crosby. So if you're double teaming one or both of those guys, you're hoping that Tyree Wilson, Adam Butler, John Jenkins, Malcolm Kuntz can win their one-on-one battles, and I think they're all capable. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that defense, too, that's the one thing that the coaching staff and the front office, Mo, are going to have to make the choice on is if they look at the defensive front and they really, as you mentioned, look at it as strong and as one of the best in the league, perhaps, if they do that, then are they okay going with the cornerbacks that they have and not going out and sign that guy's thinking, well, with these guys up front and what we're going to be able to do in the scheme, we're going to take a lot of pressure off that back end. Well, I kind of said this in a previous show that if you have a strong defensive line, cornerback becomes less of a need because the quarterback of the opposing team is not going to have much time to throw anyway. So you're relying on your defensive line to shorten his time in the pocket and force him to throw some uh, errant passes. But I also will say that eventually you know, there are quarterbacks who are going to get the ball off. There are quarterbacks who are mobile, be able to buy themselves time, be able to get the ball downfield. So you're still going to have <laughs> quarterbacks – you're going to need quality cornerbacks to cover downfield. But it does make the, the secondary's job a lot easier when you have Max Crosby, Christian Wilkins, Malcolm Kuntz, Tyree Wilson, Adam Butler, John Jenkins all bearing down on the quarterback. Yes, absolutely. It'd be very helpful. I know fans are really excited about it. And I'm well, I'm excited to see this defense get out there too. We saw how they finished strongly last year. Doesn't matter who they played and what quarterbacks they were against. They played really, really well. Kept this team in so many games. Uh, even that 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 putrid Vikings game where they lost three to nothing held the Vikings to three points. I know, but it, it's it's imagine had they just scored some more points throughout the course of the year, uh, the Raiders could have maybe won one or two more games. All right, now here's a fun little thing. It is the off season, right? So so for those of you who get upset when we talk stray from anything, just completely football on the field related, you might like this. But Mo, I know you've been busy the last week, so you probably didn't hear it. But Max Crosby, apparently on his own podcast, which I know a lot of you listen to, but then he goes on Jim Rome. So we have a clip from Jim Rome, and here is Max Crosby talking about aliens. UFOs, and that he said the Raiders charter saw a UFO on the way back from Miami. So I'm going to play this clip for everybody out there, and we'll talk a little bit about it. It's very interesting. Topic of UFOs earlier this week. For those who have not heard it, how deep did you go on that topic? And is there any doubt in your mind that there are UFOs and aliens amongst us? Oh, there definitely is. That's not even a that's not even a question. I don't want anybody to come after me, but that's uh, that's public information. But uh, Andre James, one of my uh, teammates, our center on the team, uh, he's all into UFOs and all type of different conspiracy theories. And so me and him have that bond, you know, in the locker room, we sit there and talk about <laughs> different conspiracy theories. So when he got on the podcast, all of a sudden, you know, the the like the final 30 minutes, we just start going into a you know rabbit hole about different things. But it's real. Like we were literally on a flight back from Miami and we've seen a, a UFO with our own eyes. And that sounds crazy, but you can ask the pilots, anybody that was there, it was the, it was wild. And I seen it and they had no idea what it was. There was nothing on the radar, nothing. And it was like a big shining light going in and out. So, you know, people have their own opinions, but you know, I just, I feel like there's a lot out there that, that people don't know. And I, and for me, I'm, I'm always curious. I'm always, you know, wanting to figure out what we, you know, the unknown, you know, the ocean, there's like 95% of the ocean that hasn't even been discovered. I think that's something people don't talk about enough. So yeah, our podcast goes in a lot of different directions. We've had there you go. So there's Max Crosby, Mo. He's uh he's, he likes to talk about conspiracy theories with Andre James and also UFOs. I'm surprised that none of the Raiders, if they saw a UFO on their flight, their charter back from Miami, that that it didn't come out before this. That somebody didn't share it. Maybe people aren't comfortable sharing it. But uh, Max Crosby, always you know a really interesting and dynamic guy. But uh, you know the UFO. Clearly, the UFOs uh, were not uh, did not take anybody. Um, may, or maybe maybe it was Josh McDaniels trying to to stalk the because he. A lot of people think he's as bad. Anyway, but uh, just interesting discussion to hear, you know, the Raiders outside of football and to talk about UFOs. Because let's face it, Mo, I mean, you could consider 
Max Crosby an alien for how crazy he is on the field and how well he plays and how focused he is. Well, number one, that story probably didn't get out because the Reds probably weren't interested in talking after losing to the Miami Dolphins. That's the <laughs> game that they sh- that they could have won because Miami yeah. did not play well, turned the ball over multiple times, so they're probably angry and upset and didn't want to talk about anything. The other thing is, um, I wonder what's next with Max Crosby. Is, is he going to go on a darkness retreat? Now, I will say I support darkness <laughs> retreats. I've gone on a couple of darkness <laughs> retreats like Aaron Rodgers. So, Max Crosby, if you're into darkness retreats, uh, I'm fine with that. But I, I guess the interesting thing here also is that you, you're reminded that players aren't just robot football players, that they right. have thoughts, um, they have theories of their own, they have theories that they, that they support that you may not think about. So it's interesting to get the human side of Max Crosby, and, and that's why his podcast is an interesting podcast and a fun podcast to watch, not just for, for the football perspective and the players and coaches that come on there, but for, you know, What's inside the mind of Max Crosby? What makes him tick and what does he think about when he's on and off the football field? Yeah, and that, I think it, it's what it's part of the reason he's such a great player as well is that when you're inquisitive and you're constantly questioning and looking for answers and looking to understand. So, yes, he's talking about UFOs and conspiracies here, which his show is fun because it is – it's structured, but it's not. It's a conversation, and they get down, no matter who the guest is, they talk about football. Of course they do. But at the same time, they also talk about interests off the field. So I I, I like that. That's why it was interesting when the folks over at Jim Rome Show sent me the clip. I was like, oh, yeah, I'll play that. That's, that's kind of neat. It's kind of different to, to hear from these guys uh, out there. But, Mo, the question is, do you believe in aliens? Um, that's a good question for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm agnostic toward aliens. I, so I have, like, eh. I, I'm just, I, it doesn't cross my mind because I haven't had a reason to believe aliens exist. I, I didn't have a UFO sighting like Mike, Max Crosby did, mm-hmm. but I, but then again, I don't rule it out because there've been Max Crosby is not the only person who has said this, that he has seen, you know, the light from a UFO or being from a UFO. So there are multiple people. I can see if it was one or two people saying, Aliens exist. I saw a UFO, but there are a lot of people out there who said, you know, on a random night, random day, whatever the case may be, there's proof of aliens out there. I I just haven't been exposed to it, but it doesn't mean that they don't exist. So I'm agnostic right now, Scott. See, and those sirens, they're coming to get you because they think you're an alien. Um, (laughs) No. Yeah, it's an interesting discussion. I I tend to have a a, a different view of it. I I tend to look at it as, as aliens as something that are more multi-dimensional or um um spiritual in nature so that they might not be from outer space it could be from somewhere else so very interesting discussion but that i just thought it was cool so we threw it on here because it's it's june and uh he's been talking about it in the clip but very interesting and uh, it's why i recommend you listen to his podcast it's good stuff and and certainly i know raider fans have flocked over there to listen to it So it's all good. All right. We're going to take our first break. When we come back, we're going to get to the Raider Nation mailbag for today. We've got a couple calls. we got a couple texts, including a longer one. So we're going to get to those. Uh, Before we go to the break, make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you get your audio. Also, if you're watching us on YouTube or wherever you're watching us, make sure you subscribe. Hit that notifications bell if you're on YouTube. And we will appreciate that very much. And that way you'll get notified every time we have a new show. All right, we're going to take that break. When we come back, we get to your voice, the voice of the fan on the Raider Nation mailbag. You're with Mo and Scott. This is Silver and Black Today. Welcome back to the final segment, the home stretch here on Silver and Black Today, this Tuesday edition in the month of June. It is the 11th of June already. I cannot believe it's almost the middle of June. Whew. It's like three months, Mo, three months and some days. We're getting almost under three months until the season kicks off September 8th. I mean, it's right around the corner. You know, the season ends and I'm like, you take that sigh of relief, even though we keep working through it. But, you know, the Sundays and all that jazz and the Mondays and the Thursdays, you kind of freeze up a little bit. And now it's it's just coming. It's coming fast, buddy. I mean, and everybody loves it because we get our football back. But at the same time, it's like that train that's coming and you're getting ready. You got to jump on it quickly because it's coming fast. Absolutely. And that's why, you know, I took a week off last week. That's why I'm very, uh, some people would say, I don't say non-existent, but very ghostly <laughs> on Twitter now, social media. I just, you know, with, with everything going on during the season, I just want to be my best self 
come August. Because for me, the se- you would say the season starts, not you, but the average NFL viewer may say the season starts September. But for people in the media, for those who don't know, our season kind of starts in August because training camp is important. You know, that's yes. where position jobs are won, guys are traded, cut, relief, whatever the case may be. So you kind of have to dial in late July, early August, along when the players check back in with their team. So really, we only have about six weeks of, of I don't want to say downtime, but of a low period before training camp starts. That's right. Yes. When that all ramps up, uh, when we get to – July, and yes, the battles, everything keeps going on. Then you start getting the preseason games where you get to see a little bit. Now, of course, uh, those have been reduced over the years because of the the lengthening of the schedule, and they might be reduced altogether, gone, if they go to the 18-week schedule, which we'll address at some other time. But I do think that um, it's, it's, it's important for people to realize that it's right around the corner, so get ready and get ready for those battles. And the quarterback battle is obviously a big one we talked about. You talked about it last segment coming out of mandatory minicamp, which is going on right now in Henderson. And our calls and texts mostly have to do with the quarterback position. Go figure. So it's not just us obsessing on it. It's uh, fans, listeners to the show. We certainly appreciate you guys uh, sending in your messages. By the way, if you want to get on for Thursday, 702 900 7869 that's 702 900 7869 you can call leave your name where you're calling from and your message or question be as pithy as possible uh you can also text us we got some more texts some people maybe shy don't want to be on the phone so go ahead and do that and you can text us as well and we'll read your text uh, but we love the calls too because we get good sound and audio from that. So 702-900-7869 for Thursday show. Go ahead and call whenever you like, and we will uh, queue you up for that. All right, we're going to go to our first call, Mo, and we're going all the way across the pond. Yes, Raider G from London is calling in on the mailbag. Here we go. Hi, Scott, Mo. I uh, hope you're well. This is Raider G from London, England. I'm new to the pod. Love it. Used to uh, used to listen to State of the Nation. Alas, no more. Um, but love you guys. Uh, I think most people come in here, we're looking for clear-eyed, objective, insightful analysis. You're doing a great job. Uh, you guys should stop uh, apologizing for your takes. My question, my question is about Antonio Pierce. So I love the guy. Only hear positive things about him. Um, I'm excited about the team. It's the off season. I'm excited. If the over under is six and a half, I'm hitting the over. Does it get to double digits? We don't know. Lou Getzi, the biggest variable, we don't know. But Antonio Pierce, I am all in on the guy. Right. My question though, in my experience, head coaches, successful ones, they've been head coaches before, or their coordinators making a step up. Are there other examples where, I guess, position coaches get bumped up to head coach and make make a success of it? That's my question. Thanks very much. Good luck with it all, and God bless. Bye. All right, there you go. Raider G in London, our first call from way across the Atlantic, and we appreciate the kind words, too, and thank you for for listening and watching the show, Raider G. We do appreciate that. Uh, and we love our listeners and when they give us great feedback and when they give us constructive feedback. We like that too. But Mo, uh, the first name that comes to my mind, it's a good question. We talked a little bit about it when Antonio Pierce first got the job permanently, but it's John Harbaugh in in Baltimore. John Harbaugh went from, in essence, sort of what Antonio Pierce did, went from a position coach to a head coach, and the rest is history there. There's not a long line of them, right, Mo? I, I can't think of off the top of my head anybody else. I might be escaping some. We went through the process of looking at interim coaches and their success. That hasn't been great. But the position coach to head coach, any other examples for Raider G? This is an easy one, Scott, and I talked about it I wrote about it. The late great John Madden. Oh, John, John Madden. Madden. Yes. Was How a linebacker's coach. John Madden was a linebacker's coach. I talked about it. He was, a, I believe, a D coordinator for one year in college, was a linebacker's coach for one year with the Raiders, and it was bumped up to head coach and became one of the most iconic head coaches and people in, in the NFL. So yes. there's your – so Raider G, there's your – and he's a, he's a Raider, so – Raider coach. So there's your – Raider G, there's your prime example right there. Antonio Pierce is following the exact same pathway – that John Madden followed, again, being a short-time defensive coordinator on the collegiate level, 
being a linebackers coach for a year, and then being an NFL head coach. So if there's any hope that Antonio Pierce can, can achieve greatness, there it is. It's John Madden. That's the prime example. But if you look at the offensive side of the ball and you're looking at coaches that have um, become successful, I guess successful is a relative word, mm -hmm. depending on what you define as success. But a lot of quarterback coaches are now moving up the ladder. So Zach Taylor, the Cincinnati Bengals, I believe, was a quarterback's coach, if I'm not mistaken. And he got the Bengals to a Super Bowl. Now, he didn't win the Super Bowl. The Bengals didn't win it all. But their Bengals are relatively successful right now. Now, of course, they got Joe Burrow. That helps a lot. But it goes <laughs> to my point that regardless of what your background is as a head coach, whether you're a position coach or, you know, you were a coordinator, it, it – it, I don't want to say it boils down to the quarterback, but the quarterback has a lot of sway in how successful a head coach is. So you could be a great coach, but if you don't have a quarterback to get your team to the promised land, you're going to struggle. I've seen good head coaches get fired because they didn't get the quarterback position right. I've seen mediocre head coaches go far in the playoffs because they got the quarterback position right. We will see what Aiden O'Connell and Garner Minshew are come week one. But I, I'm going to tell you this, Raider G, Antonio Pierce, as good as, as a head coach he can be, and I like Antonio Pierce too. I said he was my number two candidate to hire this offseason. A lot of his success is going to hinge upon the offense, how much that offense can generate on the scoreboard, and what the quarterback position looks like between Aiden O'Connell and Gardner Minshew. Right. And, and I think I think you're right on that. And Raider G, thanks for the call, man. I appreciate that. And and Mo, yes, thank you for reminding me, John Madden. Duh. But I, I went for recency with John Harbaugh. I think he's the best example of recent coaches. I'm a Raider historian, Scott. Yes, That's you are. With John Madden. You're, yes, you have your <laughs> your master's degree in Raiders history. Uh, so so yeah, I mean, I, I look at it too, and you touched on it, which is I think Antonio Pierce has done everything. He can, and I think the organization has supported him in, in setting it up for him to be as successful as possible. The Marvin Lewis hire, like I, I don't have a lot of faith in Marvin Lewis as an X and O's coach on the field. I know he did wells. I'm not in any way belittling him as a coach, even though he didn't win a playoff game. He, he, he got there seven times in his time with the Bengals with a very cheap owner at the time and all that stuff. But I think having him as a mentor there, having him to help, Antonio Pierce learn how to be the CEO, if you will, is important. So I think the organization in doing that stepped up and that's great that he has there and he's got coaches. The question mark, as he said, and I know we keep hammering on it, is going to be the offense. It's going to be Luke Getze. How does that system work? How do the players fit into it? How do they grasp it? Which is one of the questions I had with the minicamp. Yes, Okay, does Devontae Adams need to usually be in a mini camp and, and, and do that? No, but you have a new offense. Yes, he's familiar with some of it from his time in Green Bay, even though plays weren't called by Luke Getze in Green Bay. So so I look at that and I think to myself, he has the he has everything he needs to be successful. He has a lot of belief in Luke Getze. If Luke Getze delivers, then I think the sky's the limit. So it'll be interesting to watch it and we will see it unfold and you will hear about it here. So there you go. Raider G, thank you so much for the the call from london all right now we're going to get into our first text and this is a long one i'm going to put this up on the screen for those of you who are watching and, and i'll read it because there's a lot of words but i didn't want to miss out and this is from jay in new freedom pennsylvania right and he says hey a uh, long time listener i just wanted to say very excited for the defense specifically the front four but my biggest concern like the others is quarterback there are reporters who talk about superficial numbers like AOC saying he beat the division and hyping up his numbers. But realistically, I could be jaded. But uh, who did they play? Denver's backup, Chargers backup. The Chiefs were uh, AOC didn't complete a pass after the first quarter. As for Minshew, people love to point at – oh, sorry. I'm just replaying the video here because I had a hey, – look up. Um, people point at uh, – that he didn't complete a pass after the first quarter. With Minshew, the numbers are compared to Trevor Lawrence being similar, but there is so much more than just superficial numbers. I'm not rooting against either of the guys, but it's very hard for a Raider fan to voice displeasure with the QB room and not get hate for it. As for questions, what do you guys think leads to the attachments Raiders fans have with average to subpar players and pushing them beyond realistic potential? As well, I believe the outside of the QB room, this will be a pretty good offseason. Looking back, 
uh, at what is one thing you would change, maybe drafting someone else, looking back uh, who was available or signing someone else. Okay, that's Jay in New Freedom, Pennsylvania. So Jay, thank you for that. I appreciate the, the, the text and I'm sorry, I'm trying to work with this video and get this out of the way here so that Mo and I can get back to what we got to do. Uh, but so there's Jay in New Freedom. He's talking about the quarterback. And this is something that we've heard a lot from people, right, Mo, is this idea about, uh, you know, Aiden O'Connell being the second best rookie quarterback last year. And he beat the Chiefs. And, you know, he was five and five and five and four down the stretch with as the starter with uh, with Antonio Pierce. And I think this is where you don't have to belittle the guys. Gardner Minshew is a fine backup quarterback, a good spot starter. I think Aiden O'Connell is going to be a very good backup the rest of his career. That's where I think. I could be wrong, but that doesn't mean you're putting those guys down. It's just a reality of the quarterback room in comparison with the rest of the league. So, number one, I, I push back on the whole Aiden O'Connell beat the Chiefs. <laughs> narrative because as as the he text was said and we and we've said this multiple times and O'Connell didn't complete a pass after the first quarter of that game he did not beat the Chiefs the Raiders defense beat the Chiefs that game. right <laughs> so let's get that straight and let's look at the way the Raiders beat the Chiefs now Jay pointed out that Raiders did beat beat a bunch of teams with backup quarterbacks the Raiders themselves had a backup quarterback but as I said to um someone on the show recently these teams now have upgraded. Some of them have upgraded at the quarterback position or have their quarterback back under center. The Raiders are still working with who a lot of people think are backup quarterbacks in Gardner Minshew and Aiden O'Connell. If you think about it, if the if there was a draft, think of it this way, Scott. If there was a draft of starting quarterbacks right now, just drafting starter quarterbacks across the league, where would Aiden O'Connell and Gardner Minshew rank among that draft, just drafting starting quarterbacks across the yeah. league, would they they'd be probably I, I would take a wild guess outside of the top 20. And if you're and if your quarterback is considered an outside of the top 20 quarterback, it's not it's not wild to, to have these thoughts of, you know, maybe we're going to be a mediocre team. Now, again, I think the defense will cover some of the wars that the Raiders have on offense because the Raiders won't have to put up 30 points a game with that defense. There are going to be times that defense is only going to give up maybe 20, 21 points in the offense. If the offense could just muster up 23 points, which is two touchdowns and a few field goals, you can win some games yeah. that way. But the consistency is what I, I'm concerned about because you're not going to beat the Chiefs with two defensive touchdowns every time you play them. How yes. many games have two defensive touchdowns in them, period? So with the consistency, you're going to have to score some points. Let's remember the Chiefs offense still scored the Raiders offense in that game that they lost. Again, the defense scored two defensive touchdowns, I believe. So you, you're not that's not a sustainable way to win football games. You can't defend, you can't depend on fumble recoveries and pick sixes to win games. You're gonna have to score points with your offense, and hopefully that changes this year with Aiden O'Connell getting into his second year and growth and development, Gardner Minshew. Uh looking similar to the player he was with the Colts. And again, I will caution that he played under Shane Steichen last year. Shane Steichen is one of the best play callers in this league. Luke gets, he still has a lot to prove. So you're not going to get the same Gardner Minshew that you got last year, similar to when I said last year, you're not going to get the same Jimmy Garoppolo that you saw in San Francisco under Kyle Shanahan. So to Jay's point, I don't think Jay don't worry about the people that say, you know, you can't criticize the quarterbacks because Aiden O'Connell and Gardner Mitchell are going to be great because I've been on this I've been on this show and I've been on Bleach Report Live telling people, look, <clears throat> I'm not putting down Aiden O'Connell and Gardner Mitchell and saying they can't be serviceable starting quarterbacks. But when you look at the playoff teams last year, outside of the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Cleveland Browns, yep. most of those teams had quarterbacks that you would probably rank in the top 12. It's hard to get to the playoffs with an average or below average quarterback. And the, if the Raiders get average or below average play, they have much less margin for error. So, again, I'm not saying that it's impossible for Aiden O'Connell and Garner Mitchell to play well and for the Raiders to make the playoffs, but it's going to be a lot harder because of the of the questionable quarterback play that they might have this upcoming season. Yeah, and 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 the other thing I get this discussion, because I'm, I'm really uh, – look – when you talk the way we talk on this show, and then Raider G said he likes to come in, he gets a dose of reality. When we talk about Aiden O'Connell, and, and you get some of this, I've seen you interact with 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 listeners and and Raider Nation out there uh, online. 
because we say that and we say the Raiders could use an upgrade at quarterback does not mean we're putting down those guys. It's just a matter of fact. And I get what I've gotten a lot, Mo, when you were in, in on vacation and away from being online, um, there was a lot of conversation I had, which is, well, well look about this. Guy. What about Tom Brady? And I'm like, you're going to use Tom Brady, the, the greatest quarterback. I mean, yes, he's a six round quarterback. I get it. But if you look at the rest of the drafts, if you look at all this stuff, then I had somebody come back at me and say, well, Drew Brees. Drew Brees. And I said, well, I thought Drew Brees was a first rounder. I was one pick away. He was the first pick of the second round in 2001. He was the 32nd pick. In that draft, by the way, Michael Vick was the only other quarterback chosen above him. Okay, It was not a good quarterback draft. And Brees, because of his size and everything, dropped. And no one needed a quarterback. There was no other quarterbacks taken in the first round. So Drew Brees fell to number 32. Um, and so Drew Brees, who did okay with the Chargers, but really hit his stride when he got to New Orleans, you know, to pull those examples out. I'm not like again, I always say it, and I'm not saying this to couch my opinion. I could be wrong. But when you look at Aiden O'Connell, people are telling me, well, Aiden O'Connell, if it was next year, he would have been a first round draft pick. No. No, just not true. Well, he was projected to be, well, listen, there's guys that are 17 years old in their freshman year in college who are projected to be first round draft picks. And then they go on and they have no career. So that doesn't mean the woulda, coulda, shoulda means nothing. Now it's all going to be up to Aiden O'Connell on the field, Mo. So we we can say what we think and on all the other observers and, and analysts that we respect, like Baldy and those guys who say, yeah, he's going to be a good quarterback, but he's not going to be a franchise starter. Um, they can, He can prove us all wrong. But I don't think comparing those guys, especially when you're talking about the greatest quarterback who ever played, or Joe Montana, who won a national championship at Notre Dame when he was there in 1977, those are not who you compare Aiden O'Connell to. The best comparison for Aiden O'Connell is a guy that Devontae Adams actually talked about this offseason. It's Kirk Cousins. Kirk Cousins, yeah. A fourth rounder or middle round quarterback with limited mobility. You don't compare him to Russell Wilson because Russell Wilson was an undersized quarterback who can move around. You don't compare him to Dak Prescott, even though Dak Prescott was a fourth rounder, has has the mobility, runs a lot less now after some injuries, but coming out of Mississippi State had the mobility in, in the pocket, um, savviness to, to you know, duck and dodge out of pressure. So to me, offhand, of the starting quarterbacks in today's league and recently, the best comparison for Aiden O'Connell that Raider fans should hope for is Kirk Cousins. A guy who doesn't necessarily use his legs to extend plays, but is deadly accurate and very efficient from the pocket. That's your best comparison for Aiden O'Connell if you're looking at a ceiling type player for, for him at this point in his career. Remember, Kirk Cousins is a multi-time Pro Bowl player. Again, he is not going to beat anybody with his legs. Kirk, Kirk Cousins is as athletic as a 58-year-old dad. If you've seen him run. Hey, I'm but, only a few years from that. But but <laughs> let's see you in the pocket, Scott. I'm just saying. Uh, but but I, I will like I said that that's by far to me off the top of my head the easiest comparison of what the ceiling for Aiden O'Connell is if you're looking for a recent or a current active quarterback and what he can be in the coming years. Yeah, and think about this: there was a, the ranking USA Today did a, a ranking of the top fourth round quarterbacks in the history of the NFL. Top fourth round. Now you go, oh, so and so in the third or you in the fifth. It doesn't matter. Fourth round draft pick. They had the number one being Rich Gannon. Because Rich Grannon, obviously, later in his career, especially when he was the Raiders, he won uh, the MVP. And then you're talking about guys like Joe Theismann was a fourth rounder, right? And then Steve Berline, Aaron Brooks, and Kirk Cousins. So th that's the that's the that's the suite of guys that were taken in the fourth round who are considered now. They, Steve Berline, Joe Theismann, Joe Theismann, won, you know, won a Super Bowl. Look, Joe Theismann was a good quarterback. Again, not a mobile guy. He's probably more known for breaking his leg and having it come out of his skin than anything else, that horrific injury. But you look at those guys, they were all good quarterbacks, uh, but but also a different time. And, and I just think that the expectation that a fourth-round quarterback is going to go win you a Super Bowl when uh, it, it just hasn't happened very often at all. So, so that's just what it is. But we'll see. I mean, look, Aiden O'Connell has a chance. Gardner Minshew has a chance. And so we'll see what they do past this. All right. There we go. Now we're going to get to our next call. Our good friend, Tarek, uh, who calls in almost every show, at least every other show. Um, he has a call for us from somewhere on the road. 
Good evening, Scott and Mo. How are you gentlemen doing this evening? Um, just Tarek checking in uh, with you guys. I'm back in Boston. <laughs> Earlier today, I got into it with a Patriots fan after I referred to their former coach as Bella Cheat. Not Bella Check, it's Bella Cheat. <laughs> Those rings are tainted. I will always attest that. Anyway, moving on. Um, excited about the mandatory three day mandatory, mandatory mini camp. I think there's a lot of good storylines. Um, a little concerned about uh, Colton Miller and JPJ with some injury concerns. Uh, uh, Miller started only 11 games, but I think if he's ready by training camp, he should be just fine. Uh, but JPJ coming in as a rookie, hopefully he's ready to go. He'll need all the rest he can get. Obviously, the biggest story is AOC and Minshew. Um, I will be very surprised if AOC is not our starting quarterback uh, this fall. Uh, just wonder what kind of leap uh, leap he's going to make in year two, especially considering he's going to be learning and he's learning an entirely new system with a new OC. Uh, I do think that eventually. Um, uh, we will bring in, uh, Telesco is going to bring in um, a defensive back, a veteran defensive back uh, in free agency. Uh, I think that will happen between now and camp. Um, I did agree with what you said last week, uh, Scott, to uh, go ahead and extend Koontz. And I believe he had eight sacks the last nine games of the year. There's no reason to believe he's not going to pick up where he left off. Uh, as far as impact rookies, um, as far as um, I predict, it's going to be Bowers. Trey Taylor, uh, Tommy Eichenberg, I heard had a, had a pretty good rookie camp. And um, I'm telling you, the Lowby, the more I see this kid, the more I um, you just listen to him talk, he just seems to have that it factor as far as the genuine passion and ability. I think he's going to have a good impact as a rookie. I'd expect him to have a very good camp, and uh, whether it's special teams or in the running game or catching out of the backfield, I hope they put him right into the uh, – I hope he gets some extended time. And I uh, wonder what uh, if there are any gems on our current roster with undrafted free agents. Uh, tell me uh, what you guys think about the, some of those points, what you guys think are looking for with regards to um, some storylines coming out of minicamp. Uh, looking forward to your shows this week, you guys. Have a fantastic week, and I will talk to you guys again soon. Go Raiders. Bye-bye. There you go. Tarek on his way back from Boston where he's mixing it up with Patriots fans. Just don't do it in the south side there where you get some – Irish gangs and all that jazz. Anyway, his points, Mo, there about uh, – he made some really good points there too. I, I'm excited about a lot of these rookies. I, I, I do. I think Dylan Lobby is a guy who's going to have a big role, especially coming out of that backfield and catching the ball. Uh, Taylor's a guy that I talked to, one of my kind of – favorites in the class i'm really excited to see what he does when they get the pads on uh and then of course brock bowers and tommy eichenberg but but i think this is the first draft class that i can remember in a while where you look at them and you see the roles and what they were taken for and you say okay if they can play up to what the raiders think they can then that could really be additive to this roster this year and have an immediate impact right and i predicted i don't know for those who tuned into my Bleach Report live show, what was it, the last week of May, I projected that every rookie is going to make the initial 50-man roster. Mm -hmm. Now, as you know, sometimes the sixth rounder, the seventh rounder gets stashed on the practice squad because there just isn't enough room for them because, you know, rosters are talented. But I think every rookie is going to make the initial roster, even MJ Devonshire, who I'm still high on. I'm banging the table for MJ Devonshire because I still think he's going to see the field before the Cameron Richardson. That's just my bold prediction right mm -hmm. there. But Dylan Alby, I agree. I've, I've said this after the Raiders drafted him, that he's going to probably take over eventually the third down pass catching role. I know the Raiders did resign Amir Abdullah. But he's on the other side of 30. I, I don't, he's not obviously not the long term option. Dylan Lowby, to me, his receiving skills are one to behold. And I think he's going to have that role eventually. Maybe not to start the season, but by the end of the season, Dylan Lowby is going to be the third down guy catching passes out of the backfield, in my opinion. About the QBs, and, I, and I've, I've not kind of, I've done a 180 on this. I know I said I projected Minshew to win the job simply because I think he's a better quarterback now. But if you think about it logically, the Raiders need to figure out what Aiden O'Connell is because he, what if he is, you know, Kirk Cousins esque or Kirk Cousins like, where he's not very mobile, but very accurate in the pocket and is able to get your team uh, to the playoffs and get, you know, maybe who knows, rack up some, uh, some Pro Bowls. So if they're going to figure out what Aiden O'Connell is, he has to play. You're not, you're just not going to improve as much if you're, if you're on the sideline with a clipboard and a ball cap on. He's got to be able to play. And we saw Aiden O'Connell improve from his first start against the Chargers in what we, it was week four last year yep. compared to what he was at the end of the year. So I think you want to see at least what he can do 
taking first team reps in the offseason, knowing the offense. Remember, he's more familiar with Devontae Adams, Jacoby Myers, and Michael Mayer than Gardner Minshew because he was there last year. So he has an edge where Gardner Minshew is the more experienced overall quarterback in terms of playing time. Aiden O'Connell already has a rapport with a lot of those pass catches the Raiders have. So I, I still believe both quarterbacks will play because I think eventually the Raiders will see Aiden O'Connell as a high-end backup and they'll give Gardner Minshew a shot to see what he could do with the offense. But I do think Aiden O'Connell starts because it makes sense to find out what his upside is. He is the younger quarterback. But I want to make this clear. I still believe both quarterbacks will start more than – one game this year. I think we're going to see Garner Minshew in the center. I think we're going to see Aiden O'Connell in the center. And I think the Raiders are going to realize that they still need to go out and get their franchise quarterback next off season. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it's, you know, it, look, I think, I think we're going to see a lot. And, and, and I know last year it was like, Hey, let's see what Aiden O'Connell has. And I think you saw what you see from a, a rookie that doesn't have a ton of expectations placed on him. Uh, do he did well in spots and he did not do well in spots and and that's fine and nothing nothing wrong he finished with a 500 record as a starter really one over 500 if you consider him being named the the full-time starter after Antonio Pierce took over so so from that perspective yes I think this is a big year for him and we'll see it pretty quickly yes Tarek he's learning a new offense but he also I think the offense is a little bit closer to what he ran at Purdue and he's a smart kid. So I think that I don't think he's going to have a problem with grasping the offense and what Luke Getzey does. But I do think uh, he's got new teammates. He's got a new offensive line, all that stuff. And getting into the rhythm with those guys is what's going to win him the job or not win him the job. And I, I agree with you. I think I do give him the edge. I wrote a piece on Sports Not a couple weeks ago saying that I think he has the edge because of what the relationship he has with uh, Antonio Pierce and what he did last year. That means a lot to Pierce. And I think unless he performs below expectations, um, he'll win the job to start with unless Minshew goes nuts and has some crazy camp. But that's what I, my expectation would be. You had something else yeah. to add. Right. Really quick. There are only, in my opinion, there are only two ways that Minshew starts week one. One is if Aiden O'Connell looks awful. Uh, during the offseason from training camp to preseason. That's hard to imagine because he looked great in the in the offseason, I mean, in the preseason. Oh, training it's amazing. Camp, uh, under, under a more complicated offensive system yes. under Josh McDaniel. So a less complicated offensive system, you would expect him not to have a bad offseason, preseason training camp. Two is if Gardner Minshew just looks like the second coming of Tom Brady. And he's like a sixth round pick who looks like he could be a Hall of Famer. Now, if Gardner Minshew looks like that in the preseason training camp, then he's going to win the job. But to me, it's very clear that Gardner Minshew has to very clearly be the much better quarterback, has to way outperform Aiden O'Connell to win the job. Unless that happens, and I said this last week, I said this the week before I went on hiatus, that if Gardner Minshew and Aiden O'Connell are on equal ground and they're neck and neck, the chances are the Raiders are going to choose the younger quarterback because you would assume that Aiden O'Connell has more upside and you want to find out what he is as a full-time starter for the duration of the season. Yeah, and I don't think with Antonio Pierce, if I may go on a limb here, listen, yes, they gave Gardner Minshew two years, $25 million. I don't think that's ever going to factor into his head, meaning like, oh, we're paying this guy. So if, if Aiden O'Connell starts struggling a little bit, I don't, I don't even think he's going to have a quick hook. I really don't. I think Gardner Minshew, the $25 million they spent on him was well spent as an insurance policy as somebody who's there, just like he was in Indianapolis last year. And look, they needed him in Indianapolis last year after what happened to Anthony Richardson. So I don't think that plays into the factor. I think he will get more grace and the opportunity to, to play and win. Now, if it goes on too long and it starts to hurt your chances of win ball games, then you have to do what you got to do. But I don't anticipate that with uh, Aiden O'Connell. So we'll see how it all rolls out. All right, there you go. We appreciate your your uh, text, Jay. And again, if you want to call us or text us, however you want to do it, it's 702-900-7869. That's area code 702-900-7869. No excuse not to. We're getting Raider G from London. London. If he can do it, you can do it. No problem. Okay, here we go. Here's our next text, Mo. This is from Raider Love in Athens, Alabama. Regarding the quarterbacks, I like both quarterbacks. I'm more in favor of Gardner. He looks more mobile of the two, but in the end, I'm for whoever wins out. So let's say Gardner wins a spot, or for this question, 
it would work for either. Let's say they go 25 yards versus uh, five interceptions. Maybe they even run into TDs. That, along with three or four TDs on defense, get us into the playoffs. We end up playing the Jets in the playoffs and lose. Does that, in your eyes, get them a couple of years as a starter? Or uh, basically, even if we even if we draft high in the draft, uh, and that's from Raider Love in Alabama. So, Mo, that's the question. And, and it's funny, when you were gone, Jacob from Fresno on Thursday had this question too. His question, which gets to what Raider Love's asking as well, and thank you for the text, is what does Aiden O'Connell have to do to become the franchise quarterback at least another year after this year, right? Because, listen, the NFL, anything can happen. It's a year-by-year -year league unless you're somebody like Patrick Mahomes or somebody like that. So, Mo, the question is, what does he have to do or what do one of them have to do for the Raiders to say next year, nah, we don't need a quarterback? They have to be the reason why the Raiders win multiple games and get to the playoffs. Pro Bowl – Status is not enough because Gardner Minshew yeah. went to the Pro Bowl last year. He had, I believe, 15 touchdown passes and I think nine interceptions or something like that. Pro Bowl really is just, I don't want to call it hollow, but it could be very misleading who gets into the Pro Bowl, right? We know that. So I, I throughout, the, throughout the Pro Bowl accolades, of course, if they become all pros, then that's a whole different story. Then, yeah. then, you're, then you're having a different conversation than, yeah, they look like the franchise quarterback. But they have to be the reason why that offense puts up multiple points and wins multiple games yeah i'm talking getting to the playoffs because if they miss the playoffs if those two quarterbacks play decent and raise miss the playoffs you're, you're drafting a quarterback yeah right because you're probably going to have maybe a mid first round pick and and supposedly next year's draft quarterback class isn't as good as, as this year so you will be in range to, to draft maybe our top three four quarterback prospects so again they have to be the reason why the Raiders win multiple games and their overall numbers have to be pretty good. I'm talking 4,000 plus yards, 25 plus touchdown passes, and not a lot of interceptions. That's the other thing, not turning the ball over, protecting the football, because other than that, you're drafting a quarterback. It can't be the defense helped the Raiders get to the playoffs because then you're still drafting a quarterback and saying, if we had a serviceable or a better quarterback, then we could be a Super Bowl contender. If the Raiders' defense has to score touchdowns consistently to win football games, neither Aiden O'Connell or Garner Minshew are the, is the answer because eventually your offense has to do something. Right, twenty sub twenty four points a game is not enough to win consistency to win consistently in this league. Got to score points on offense. And Mo, that was my answer to Jacob on Thursday with the question: What does he need to do to keep the job, so to speak? And I said he's got to. You have to see clearly. And I think this is this isn't it doesn't take an analyst. It's it's you as a as a casual fan, it's going to take him take putting the team on his shoulders and winning games. For example, you're down three points in the fourth quarter. You got the ball on your own twenty, and you drive down and you score, and you do that a lot, right? You do that mo. You do that. And I didn't even bring in the stat, the number, like you were saying, four thousand yards. That may be true, but I do think it has to be clear that. The quarterback comes in, is in command, takes his team in tough situations when he's challenged and goes down and wins the game for them on offense. To your point, this defense, and it, for these quarterbacks, there should be no excuses because we talk about all the weapons on offense, right? Yes, offensive line still looks like it's going to be pretty good. It might even be better with what they did, obviously, in the draft. But you look at that, not a lot of excuses there. You have your defense, which we're talking about maybe the best front four, at least in the top three of the league, and the rest of the defense being good, doing what they did last year. So really, for a quarterback in this situation, they're set up to succeed. Now, the play calling, that's the separate issue. that we, You can't control that, so we'll see how that goes. But that's exactly what I said. You have to win games, you have to get your team into the playoffs, and you have to show that you are a difference and you are the reason why – your team, when it was down or when it needed to go get a score to get itself a bigger lead to put a game away, that's the other thing, just because you're ahead doesn't mean you don't put the game away. Those are the types of things you see, the traits you see in quarterbacks who are going to be franchise quarterbacks. And I brought up the stat numbers, 4,000, around 4,000 plus yards, 25 touchdowns, because unlike Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, Gardner Minshew and Aiden O'Connor aren't going to give you a lot as, as ball Running. carriers. 
Yeah. They're not going to, they're not, unlike Josh Allen and, and Lamar Jackson could get away with not throwing for 25 touchdowns or 4,000 yards. Josh Allen had over 4,000, but Lamar Jackson doesn't throw for 4,000 yards in a season, but he gives you so much in the ground game that it, it compensates for the lack of passing value n- numbers. With Garner Minshew and Aiden O'Connell, you're not getting a an aspect of the of the offense from them on the ground. So they have to right. do all their damage and make all their production through the air. And that's why I say around 4,000 yards, around 25 touch, uh, 25 plus touchdown passes. Because think about it. If they play 17 games, 25 touchdown passes is what? Is, is a touchdown and a half per game on average. Yes. You're asking for one to two touchdowns per game. If your starting quarterback cannot give you one to two touchdowns per game without the running aspect, then you're looking for another quarterback to draft next year. Right, and you talked about turnovers too. So, so if you're throwing for 25 touchdowns, uh, you need to have a three to one touchdown to interception ratio too, right? I mean, let's face it. I, I think that's close to that. Something so you like can't that. be 25 touchdowns and 20 interceptions, right? That's not going to cut it because that means you're turning the ball over too much. So I think that's what 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 you're going to go by if you want to talk about the stats. But again, it's so much more than that. It's it's what you see when you saw in the Super Bowl, and I know everybody out there because you're Raider fans don't want to hear about the Chiefs, but they are who they are. And you saw Patrick Mahomes come from behind. You saw Tom Brady do that. You saw Josh Allen do it. Of course, he doesn't do it as much in the playoffs when they have to get to the Super Bowl, but he's done it through the course of his young career. And you see those quarterbacks, and that's what they do at the that the critical time when the the, the 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 momentum can swing either way. They step up, they make the plays, they get the ball where it's supposed to go. And to me, that's what you have to see in that guy. Just plain and simple. And the other thing I want to say about the stats is it also matters when that quarterback throws those touchdown passes. So you know, there's a such thing as garbage time, and this is why sure. advanced analytics are important. QBR passer rating. It takes all of those those uh, game situations into account. You can throw 25 touchdown passes, but if 15 of those touchdown passes are in garbage time and your team is down by three touchdowns, you know it, it's not the same as throwing most of those touchdown passes when it's a competitive game or when you're in a game-winning drive. So there's a game-winning drive stat. There's a fourth-quarter comeback stat. That's more of a team stat. But it, it, it matters when you throw those touchdown passes, when you throw those interceptions. Are you turning the ball over in the fourth quarter in the red zone? Are you leading your team to game-winning drives and finishing drives with a touchdown pass and not handing it off at the one-yard line to, to Zamir White or Alexander Madison with the run game dominating the offense? Is it a run-heavy offense? Because with Luke Getze, I know he had an athletic quarterback in Chicago, Justin Fields, who contributed a lot to the run game. Are the Raiders going to be run-dominant? Because if the Raiders are, let's say, top five in rushing and they're bottom five in passing attempts – then you're probably drafting a quarterback next year because it shows that the coaching staff doesn't really trust a quarterback in a pass-heavy system. So it also right. matters. There's a lot of context. So I throw out those numbers as base figure numbers. But within the context, you know, how is Luke Getzey running the offense? When is this, when is the quarterback throwing these touchdown passes? Is he leading these scoring drives? All of that stuff matters. It matters. And, and that's the thing. You have to have that killer instinct too. Like I said, putting teams away. You know, when you're up and you're still in there doing what you need to do, getting first downs. I mean, it's it, it's pretty clear. So we'll see. But uh, we appreciate the the text. Raider love down in Alabama. So thank you for that one. And uh, a lot of quarterback questions today. So for those of you who say, well, you keep talking about the quarterback. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you don't say that. But nonetheless, we talk a lot about the quarterback because it's so vital in the NFL. And it's going to be fascinating to watch in training camp and even this three-day mini camp going on right now how those guys are doing and what we're hearing out of that. So it'll be fun. Mo, we're going to call it uh, a show now. Uh, We're done for the day on Tuesday. We'll be back on Thursday. Anything folks need to be aware of that you're up to besides uh, dark retreats and um, vacations to some private islands or somewhere? Uh, as usual, you can always hit me up on Mo Moton, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N, on Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it. Always there to answer your questions about whatever you got for the Raiders or just NFL in general. I will say that I'm not as active on social media anymore, but don't be afraid to, to reach out if you have a question or a comment. Sports not. I have a piece coming out, Raiders to-do list, pre-training camp mm. to-do list. It'll be out Thursday. I have three to five items on there, things that the Raiders should do before they return for training camp late July, early August. There you go. So you can catch that. 
as well. And you can catch Mo back on here on Thursday. So we appreciate it. Do us a favor. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your audio. And if you're watching us on video, subscribe wherever you're watching us. We certainly appreciate it. Again, the number is 702-900-7869. 702-900-7869 if you want to get on Thursday's show as well. Oh, Mo, you got something else? I, I, I just want to right say, I just want to, I just want, I just, I just want to be clear about something because I know people hear a lot of si sirens in the background. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not at a Rikers Island cell somewhere. Uh, no, I'm, <laughs> he's not. Just a busy day in New York City out here, so don't get any ideas because no people are going to say, "What are those sirens well, that I hear in the background when Mo's talking?" I'm not at Rikers, people. I'm not at Rikers. Yeah. It's not a Rikers cell. I'm just in New York City in the, on a busy Tuesday morning. It's after. summer, and so things are getting hot. And that means yeah. there's all kinds of stuff going on. So the block, you gotta, is, hot. The block oh, is definitely hot. Yes. Hot in the city. Hot time. Summer in the city. Okay. <laughs> Doing some classic rock for you there. Uh, all right, my friend, I will see you on Thursday. See you Thursday. All right. For our producer, Mike Robbie, for Mo Moten, I'm Scott Colbrands, and this has been Silver and Black Today. We'll talk to you guys on Thursday. Bye-bye.